And this girl, uh, it was at the end of the four days of meetings, and I mean, I was tired. We had led worship two and a half hours, preached for two hours. <coughs> so, yeah, I know I lived through one of your services. I understand. <laughs> um, and and this, this girl come up, and she's got problem with her tendons in her legs. Since she was two years old, she wore high heels. High heels. She'd grab her mom's high heels, and then she had her own pair. And for some reason, she used to wear them all day long, and she'd wear them to bed even. The problem with this is kind of like some people that suck your thumb early in the days. You pull your teeth out in development. Because you, 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 you know what I'm saying? So my son had some of that stuff, and we're working on all that. But And so the tendons don't develop the way they're supposed to. So guess what? For her seven years of developing and her tendons in her legs, her legs grew so where she could only stand like this on her tippy toes, and she she walked everywhere like this. So here she is going around the entire, I mean, she's going around the entire place like this, and I felt bad, and then my daughter comes up to me who's seen it all, okay? My daughter, let me, let me tell you, kids know everything. They're not going to let you get away with nothing. You understand? Yeah, you weren't really annoyed tonight, were you? Yes, I was. Yeah, right there. Come on. Oh, well, so she's walking around like this. Joy comes up to me, Daddy, can you pray for this girl that she get healed? And I'll be honest, when you're tired and you're thinking, Lord, I hope she can do it, you know, you turn out these thoughts. I just had compassion hit my heart. I just broke it, totally broke it. I grabbed this girl as if she was my daughter, put her in my hands, put her legs up in my, in my legs like this. And I begin to massage her ankles and speak the word of God over her life. And I started working out this miracle. I mean, I'm working it out, right? I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm going to break her ankle. You know? We don't have insurance in the ministry. You know? <laughs> Jesus is my insurance. I have a big deductible if he doesn't come through. <laughs> so I'm working out. <laughs> Somebody get that thing. So I'm working, I'm working out the ankle and everything. And, and I just felt faith come on me. And I thought about. My good friend Nathan Morris from the Bay Revival, when he laid hands upon the uh, worship leader, Delia Knox, who was in a wheelchair, yes. quadriplegic from the neck down, or the waist down. She couldn't move her legs at all. Not quadriplegic, paraplegic. She couldn't move her legs at all. And after 24 years, he lays hands on her out of compassion from his heart and out of the move of God. And she rises up out of her wheelchair and ends up walking out. And, of course, the YouTube clip goes absolutely viral, and now there's like, I don't know, close to 700,000 hits on the video, and people watch it, and there's other people that have now come out of wheelchairs just from watching that, okay. and I thought about that as I'm sitting here with her in my hands, I thought, you can do that with some woman who's in a big crowd, why can't you do that with this little girl, and I just believe, I says, little girl, stand at your feet right now, her aunt was there, she could testify that this is really how she's been all these years, and and she she saw she saw everything you know and all that and and I just said stand and I watched everybody saw this. This is at the end. This wasn't like a big crowd or anything. It was at the end, and the girl was like this. And I said now stand down. I said now do something by faith. Take your right foot and put it down, and she went like this. She goes, and I'm kind of like that too. I wasn't like come on give God praise. I was like holy cow. Then she put her other foot halfway down. I said, now, come on, do something and ru run across, do what you can do. And she started running like this. And next thing you know, she's putting her right foot down and she starts running like this. And the aunt just, fall, just like loses it. And the girl gets healed. Today, she's walking normal, a little bit of a limp left in her left leg, but she could not stand any flat foot at all. Because if she did, her body would go back because of the way her tendons grew. I watched it with my own eyes. My daughter looked at me and she goes, that's real, isn't it? I go, ask the little girl. Come on, isn't that awesome? I mean, that's, that is God healing on command. What's the other testimony we had from three? The back, thank you. Listen to this one. We did a burn conference in Syracuse, New York just three weeks ago, I think, Right? I don't even know what century I'm in. Anyway, I, I never do. I don't even know what city or state I'm in sometimes. So we're in Syracuse, New York, 
and it's the end of this whole week conference, four days that were there, Sunday through Wednesday. We said we're gonna pray for the sick on the last night and anoint everybody and lay hands on them. And this lady shows up with this other lady. And she fell off a roof that day. She's 58 years old. First, I'm thinking, what were you doing on the roof? But she's 58 years old. She rolled off the roof and popped her hip out and crushed her spine. And they brought her in like this with two people holding her up. Perfectly normal the day before. Just, I mean, and she literally was in so much pain. You watched her walk in the place like this. She looked like a hunchback. I mean, it was like really bad. So this other lady gets upset because we didn't pray for her at the time that she wanted to get prayer and the time that she thought the service should have gone. You know, if we had catered to everybody, we wouldn't be able to help anybody out because everybody would be doing their thing instead of just getting in the flow of what God's doing. Come on, somebody tonight. So we just, I'm, sitting, I'm standing there by the table. My friend Tom is preaching. This woman comes up to me with an attitude and she goes, are you gonna pray for these people? This woman's leaving now. Look what's going on. Like, it's my fault. And I'm just looking and saying, like, I'm gonna bless you if you don't step back a couple feet. I'm gonna use a five-fold calling. It's called the apostles, pastors, prophet, teachers, and evangelists. And it works like this. Lift your hands and close your eyes. I mean, she had a terrible attitude. And I understand the, the persistence and the, the reason she was upset. She just wanted her friend healed. But you know, there's, 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 kind of, there's a way to get a hold of God's attention and that's not one of them. Just trust him that he's gonna do the work. They're waiting for a wand to be just bibbidi bobbidi boo like it's the Cinderella anointing or something, you know? But really, those who believe, God's gonna heal them. So I told this lady, I said, all right, just give me one moment. Why don't you stand over there? <laughs> And then I walked out and the lady was in the lobby. There's no audience. There's no audience. The audience is inside the sanctuary. I walk out, my wife's with me. This woman's in pain, so bad so, she's weeping uncontrollably going, I can't take the pain, it's so bad. Once again, compassion hits my heart, not just another case or another person coming through, another number or not somebody else that might see the ministry and all this other stuff. I don't think like that. Compassion comes on me for this woman, and I see my aunt. That's how I look at people. I see my aunt, either my Aunt Bev or my Aunt Joyce or my mother, and I just have compassion, and I treat people that way the best I possibly can. I looked her in her face. She had no faith, no hope at all, and she was getting upset like this lady. I said, well, let's remove this lady from the equation first of all. So I told this lady to get off to the side, and she's still running her mouth and everything. <laughs> you know, God bless her. She's such a nice lady. Anyway, and I begin to talk to this lady, and I look her in the eye, we sit her down in the chair, and I look her in the eye, and I said, dear lady, let me ask you a question. At what time of the service did you come in tonight? I says, was it during the praise and worship by chance? She goes, oh, yes, it was. I said, do you remember the song that I sang, Restore Me? And there's a, the song is by Lendl Cooley from the Brownsville Revival. It, it goes like this. It goes, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. You're looking for those who are broken and contrite. Look here with favor. And then the chorus goes like this. Restore me with joy from heaven. Restore me to sing your praise. Restore me with joy from heaven and I'll follow your ways. I says, were you there that? She goes, actually, I came in during that song. I says, you did? I said, I need to ask you a question. Did you feel at all any pain when you first sat down and began to worship? And she goes, oh, God, I'm in so much pain. I said, but lady, what about that time when worship was going on? Did you feel any pain? She goes, I guess she goes, well, actually, during that song, and it was a beautiful song. I'm like, lady, it doesn't matter about that. I'm asking, did you feel pain leave you at any time during the worship? She goes, well, actually, yes. I says, that's right. The Bible says in the presence of the Lord, there's healing. And I began to minister to her and I said, the healing presence of God is still permeating your body right this very moment. 
I says, why don't you and I capitalize on this tonight? I says, I'll tell you what's going to happen to you. And I start speaking. It's one of these autopilot things again. I step back and look, and there's somebody else ministering. But I'm watching this all happen, but my mouth is moving. <laughs> you don't know what's going on, you know? It's just, you're just on autopilot. And so I said, lady, I'm going to freak you out. You're going to stand up today, right this moment in front of all your friends, especially that lady right there, and you're going to stand up and you're going to walk out of here completely healed and you'll have no pain. Do you believe God can do that? She goes, well, I sure hope so. I said, don't say hope so. Look at me. I said, I believe. And I said, my faith is going to heal you and it's going to cause you to have faith. And I said, you're going to rise up. So in front of all these, there's maybe about four people that were in the lobby uh, the rest of the 300 people were in the sanctuary, grabbed her by the hand, and I just began to speak life into her body. Folks, in front of my eyes and four other witnesses, she went like this. <coughs> Stood there with eyes huge, and she just went, my God. And I went, whoa. And she began to walk, and I walked with her, and then I let her go, and she walked on her own. Folks, she walked out on her own two feet with no help. She said the pain was gone. I prescribed her two live Florida outpouring CDs to call me in the morning. <laughs> totally healed. Totally healed. That night. Come on, somebody say God still heals. This isn't some testimony. This isn't some testimony from five, six, seven years ago. This just happened three weeks ago. In New York State, because God moves according to those who believe him. You understand? Amen. Isn't that encouraging? That we can go after God for the miraculous? It's not like you're just called to preach. You're not just called to evangelize. You're not just called to sing. You're called to heal. You're called to raise the dead. You're called to cleanse the lepers. You're called to open up deaf ears and blinded eyes. You're called to press in for things even when everything seems completely complicated. It ain't gonna happen. You're still called to press in and believe anyway. Can somebody say amen tonight? All right, we're going to show this quick clip. It's called uh, Australian Testimonies. Right in the middle of Brisbane, Australia, this revival lasted 29 days. We were only scheduled for a few days. It turned into 21, 21 nights. And I began calling things out in the middle of worship. Watch this. Just hit the lights if you would. Been really sore, and I've, it's all free, like it's not tight. I can 
move my arms and shoulders and it doesn't hurt. Do what you couldn't do before right now. It would hurt because I'd feel it like go run down my arms and it, yeah, and I can, like I'm not feeling the tightness. It's gone, it's all loose. <laughs> What's happening? I wake up with a sore neck. Yeah, I slept funny. But now I feel healed. Amen. What couldn't you do before? Do what you couldn't do before. That. It's hurting. Or continue to right now in the name of Jesus. Continue it, Lord. What happened? I had arthritis all through my body, and if, every time I turned my neck, it would grate badly. And it's got grating now. So do what you couldn't do before. Do what you couldn't do before. Show us. And I, I can stretch my fist now as well. Thank you, Lord. Just touch her. Right now. There goes your fire right through her. Fire. There it is. There it is. What's happening? Why, what's going on? When I was in the anointing, I got a lot of family that are sick, and I just said, oh, Father, I just want to stand with you. Thank you, you're doing what? I stood up and I just said, just go. Cancer, go. Sugar, diabetes, go. Now, in Jesus' name. Just got a big pick in the back of my neck. Just a big crack. And I just know that God's doing something. Can you feel, hold on, don't go away. You feel, you felt heat inside your body? I don't know, it was just one big loud crack in the back of my neck. Back of yeah. And what, I, forgive me, I kind of couldn't hear everything, but you said cancer with your dad? No. Sugar diabetes with my father. Cancer with my two aunties. Let's just lift your hands, sweet people, towards this lady. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus for her two aunties, for the diabetes right now. We curse it like Jesus cursed the fig tree. And God, we curse that cancer right now. What couldn't you do before? I couldn't bend. All right, let's see. What happened to you tonight? I had intense pain at the back of my neck, and as you were praying, it just like felt like it just went to and dropped out. And wow. Yeah, it was awesome. Praise the Lord. What couldn't you do before? Show us what you couldn't do before. Very stiff. So. through the bones, joints, you know, and it's just... <sighs> Come on, let's give the ball. What's happening? What happened to you tonight? Testimony tonight. I, I have a low uh, sore so, so back. So low back. Before. Sore, sore back. Yeah, before. Tonight, when you came in, you had a sore back during the worship. Yes. What happened? And now I feel very comfortable. Give her some more comfort.
Isn't that awesome? Hey, this is Roy Fields and Daniel Forte. You can shut Good that morning. Down. Buongiorno. Shut down Mateo. Buongiorno. See, he said it. Thank you, guys. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you guys enjoy that clip? Yeah. Did anybody get freaked out by that? Anybody go, I don't want that to happen to me? <laughs> um, if you can give me the lights back a little bit, that would be great. Don't worry about the sound. You know what? You show yourself to be a more, we'll be more spiritual people today and we'll act like we don't really need sound systems, even though we do. <laughs> I don't know what's been, has this been following us? The last three churches, we've just had a lot of trouble with the sound systems. But I'll tell you, when we were in Albany, actually the sound, oh my gosh, I don't know what happened. One night, the sound was so bad that people were coming up to me and saying, I can't hear anything he's saying. All I can hear is the keyboard. And there's Roy, worship, worship, worship. And he's trying to get him to worship. And they're like staring at him like, I can't find the pipes. <laughs> and people are, oh, I love it. Bless their heart. They're pressing in. You know, they're, they're, they're going, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let sound take my, you know, my, my pre, pre, you know, my gift from God, my time, my encounter. They're pressing in and, you, you know, you, you know, their eardrums are like just, just going boom, you know, vibrating underneath the sound pressure. And they're like, you know, I'm not going to let anything take me away from my Jesus. And, you know, you can just see them trying so hard. And uh, finally, I think Roy was like, okay, this is it. We're going to stop. And uh, I came up and I just said, I'm sorry, it was so loud, you, you know, behind the monitors, he couldn't tell how loud it was. And um, it was, and you know, and I talked a little bit about, about revival that I remember we talked about revival and we talked about being hungry. And I mean, I think that was the first night, the first night I actually mentioned to people that I believe God wanted us to cry for this region for revival. And it was the first night I actually mentioned it and began to express my passion and my desire because in the natural, everything probably looks like, you know, we've had a lot of floods and our churches are getting discouraged and, you know, all the great moves of God and the great hot places that used to be on fire that used to have revival are dying down. And in the natural, people are going, it doesn't really look like that in, to us. But, it, but, you know, that's what I love about seasons when God's ready to move, you know. Um, my season when I pursued God for revival, um, I remember reading that when the, before the 90s, before the great revivals of the 90s, we actually had a season of just tremendous discouragement in the church. I mean, Jimmy Baker fell, Jimmy Swaggart fell, several different leaders all began to fall all at this season. And it was a time where it seemed like the body of Christ in America looked like the last place in the world you ever wanted to visit. Come on, God, send me to Africa. Send me somewhere else. I'll go anywhere but America because they don't want nothing to do with God over there. You know, and they were so discouraged. And yet God was able to pour out such a powerful anointing and healing presence in the 90s on the back of all these things that seemed to be to take away the faith and the encouragement of the body of Christ in America. And so the next day after these meetings, we talked about revival. You know, we, I prayed for several people. I remember I prayed for this one guy who was in a wheelchair and um, I was just walking around praying for people and speaking to people kind of like what I do. And I'll, I'll be talking and God will give me a word and I'll just give it and then I'll keep talking. And, you know, I just, that's just kind of the flow, you know. It's like Jesus talks to us as we walk and talk. You know what I'm saying? It's not like you have to stop and pray for 20 minutes and get yourself all ready and, and then hear God. No, he just sort of talks as you walk through your normal day. And that's what he does when I preach, you know. And um, so I laid my hands on this guy, and he was in a wheelchair. And I was just praying for him because he looked like he wanted prayer. But I didn't know that he actually didn't. He wasn't coming up for prayer. He was actually sitting there. That was his seat was right by the front because that was the place for his wheelchair. And so I, I prayed for him. And you know, I didn't know what was wrong with him, but he, he just sort of sat up and he was like, oh my gosh, he goes, one of my discs in my back was out of place. And he goes, I have excruciating pain throughout my back. And the reason why I was in the wheelchair was because he was in such bad pain. It wasn't that he couldn't walk. And so he actually, I didn't ask him. He just got up and he started walking around. And he was like, I just can't believe this. He's walking around, you know, it's a little bit bigger, but he's just walking. He's like, oh my gosh, the pain is all gone. And he's all excited. And then I said, you know, do you know God's trying to show you that he loves you? He goes, I think I'm beginning to realize that. That's, that's what God's touch is about. God's touch is, especially for us Christians who in our heads say God loves me, God wants to heal, God wants to move, but in our hearts we're not always so sure. I mean, that's the reality of a lot of Christians. And then the next day, 
Yes, yeah, that's true. I'll, I'll get to that. Hold on a second. So the next day, after, after this, we're doing another meeting. <laughs> Here we're doing another meeting, and the sound is just like, okay, we're, you know, chalkboard sound. You know, it's just not working. And I remember, you know, I'm watching Roy up there, and he's talking. And all of a sudden, he starts, you know, this is the suddenlings of God. You just have no idea when he's just going to break in on you. These are just the suddenlies that we've experienced in our life. And most of the time, you know, we're, we're pressing through and we're going, okay, God, I mean, I can remember every revival. I mean, in Wales, in Kingston, every revival we ever had, it just like, oh, my gosh, like, God, it doesn't look like revival at all. And then a suddenly, a suddenly would happen. And so this night, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, God, rescue this meeting, rescue us tonight someday, any day, and Roy's just up there talking, and, you know, he just, when he talks, he just waits, he's, he talks, and he waits, and he talks, and he waits on the Holy Spirit, and I remember he started talking about heaven, and he was talking about the reality of heaven, and I was thinking, okay, where's he going with this, and he just started sharing an experience, which I won't share for him, but he was sharing an experience that he had where heaven began to come and become very real to him in his pastor's house, and there's so many different encounters that God has given to my husband, and every encounter has been a suddenly. It's been a time when you least expect it. And as he was talking about heaven, I told this story, I think, the other night. But there was, that was the night there was this young girl named Alicia who was sitting there. And you've got to imagine people that come out of traditional churches. And maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you come out of a traditional church and you don't understand all this revival stuff. And you don't understand people falling on the floor. And it doesn't seem real to you. But this was her. And she's saying, you know, I don't know if I can heal people. I don't really know that. And as he began to talk about heaven, I remember I felt this tangible presence begin to come into the room. And I felt this several times in my life when, you know, yes, you know, you just feel like, okay, this is an ordinary meeting. That's why I always say I'm tired of ordinary meetings. And it's not that you have to make it an ordinary meeting. But you know what? The hunger and desperation of people can transform an ordinary meeting into a meeting that begins to usher in the presence of God. Do you know the breeding ground for miracles is the expectation of the people? That's how you get the God to move miraculously. You begin to expect. You begin to hunger. You begin to press in. You begin to desire miracles. You begin to desire God to move. You begin to desire God to touch you one more time. You begin to get hungry for the things of God. And in that hunger, your life and your sh begins to shift into, out of yourself and into a realm where God can touch you. And as he began to talk about heaven and the reality of heaven, and he's like, you know, it, it, there is a he you know, maybe heaven's over there, but maybe heaven's here. Maybe there's a cloud of witnesses that's standing all around us who's passed on, but they're still standing around us, cheering us on, saying, go for it. Go for it. We've given our time. We've given our moment. But you go for it because you're the one. You're the one who's been challenged to rise up and put the enemy under your feet. You're the one to subdue and, and take authority and power over the enemy because you're the one who was given that rod and rule to have dominion. And as they began to talk about this, I mean, I, you could just feel the whole atmosphere. And I'm looking, and this is how you know that, that God's really doing something, is when the people that you're really close to, that you've known for a long time, are going, whoa, something's happening. Because they're nice, they're not trying to make you feel good about yourself. Sometimes when you just meet somebody, you know, you don't do a very good job, but they're never going to tell you. Come on, you know what I mean, right? You guys know what I mean. Well, this is people we've known. We were, did 52 days with them, and we had revival with them. So they knew this, but they said, something's changing here. Something's happening here. And I remember this, I was just standing there. You could just feel the presence of God. You could just feel that weight just begin to come into the room. And it's one of those weights where you just want to, if you're like us, you've been seasoned in it. You just want to lay there and just let the Holy Spirit just begin to wash over you and begin to sink. Like even right now, I can just feel that tangible presence of the Holy Spirit just walking in. Even today as I was walking, I could just feel his presence just beginning to seep into my heart. And I was going, God, God, sometimes things don't look like revival, but I love it when you break in. I love it when you have an encounter. I love when your presence begins to come and people's hearts begin to t get touched, you know? And then I'm thinking, are my kids doing what they're supposed to do? But, oh, I'm so caught up in God. Oh, what was I supposed to do? I forgot. I forgot what they were. What, what, what happened? <laughs> Wait, where are my kids anyway? Aunt Bev, where are my kids, by the way? Have they eaten yet? I don't know if you got that message. Anyway, <laughs> the tangible presence of God began to come, and he calls, and he's looking in the eyes of this girl, and he calls her out, and he says, you know it. You know it. You know heaven's real. 
You know what I'm talking about is real. And this girl, you got to get, had been at, with us at Kingdom Bound. And she had never been in those 50 days of revival with us. So at Kingdom Bound, we're just sitting around the fire, ministering. And Roy's playing these, you know, tunes. And here's this girl just enjoying us. But now she gets, and all of a sudden, she begins to realize heaven is real. That God is real. That it's more than just going to church. It's more than just hearing a sermon. And, she, and, she, and he pulls her out. And she's, we didn't know that she had prayed this prayer. And she said, God, I don't really know if I can heal the sick. I don't really know if I can be used to change people's lives. I have great compassion. I told this a, a couple days ago. But I don't really know. She said, but, you know, if you would just let me have a tingling in my hands or anything, then I would know that, that you could use me. And so Roy calls her up, and he be just goes to lay hands on her, and he just takes her by the hand, and the anointing just falls all the way over her. Jesus, what's your name? Deborah. Father, I thank you for Deborah, and I thank you for the anointing upon her life. Father, I thank you that this is a season of refreshing. Lord, I thank you that you're pouring refreshing upon Deborah, and this is a season where the glory of the Lord is going to begin to manifest in her life. Father, I thank you for Deborah, and the Lord says, I've called you to a new season, my daughter. I've called you up out of, out of tough times, out of hard times, out of times that feels like, like nothing's moving, and the Lord says, I planted a seed of faith in your heart, and with that seed of faith, you're going to take it, and you're going to plant something great and something big. And the Lord says, as you water this seed and as you water it, as you water it with tender love and care, even though it doesn't look big right now, it doesn't look great right now, as you water this seed, that I will begin to raise up something that you have known you were called to for years. You have known in your heart you have been called to this for years. As you tend to water it with a seed of love and compassion, you will see it rise up and overshadow you. The greatness of this thing that you're called to will overshadow you. And the Lord says, those that rise up from underneath you will be stronger and even more powerful than you could ever imagine or think but because of the love and the compassion that you have poured into them I says the Lord will use them to even run circles and greater things than you could ever think or imagine because you pour strength and compassion and love and the power to do great things into them and Deborah I loose that season of refreshing into you in Jesus name can I tell you something yes you can tell me something it's really important okay that's why I came over here last night after you ministered, you ministered to everybody for about a, a while, <laughs> and then you called the young people forward, and my daughter was one of those young people, and she was over in that corner, and, and you kept talking about, how hungry are you? How hungry are you? If you're hungry, come forward. Young people, come forward. You didn't know this, but three days ago, she says, Mom, why don't I pray in tongues? I said, Honey, the time will come. You're going to be baptized in the Spirit, and you're going to pray in tongues. We'll just ask God for it. Yesterday on the way here, she says, Mom, I want to be one of those people that when they touch me, they touch God. Mm -hmm. I said, all right. I said, we'll ask God, and when the time is right, God will release that. She stood over there, and, we, and she went, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay? Wow. <laughs> to, tell, to make a long story short, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit. She ended up praying in tongues. She ended up knocking me down. <laughs> now that <laughs> my kid my kid knocked me down in the spirit wow. and I was so humbled and I'm, I, I just felt I came over to tell Pastor John I just feel people need to know here in Elmira that the weight of the glory of God was upon me and I could not get up okay I wanted to get up because I'm the mom okay I'm the mom and I'm a homeschool mom and she comes to me later she says hey mom by the way I kind of felt like you were the student and I was the teacher at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, honey, I, said, I felt that too because what God did was so amazing. I had such a broken childhood, and he used my own daughter to minister healing to my child's heart. It was, it was the most amazing thing. And I just want people here to know, I believe the weight of the glory of God wants to fall tonight. And I believe there's a resistance, but I believe if we press in, we are going to get that. And you may be pinned to the ground by the glory of God. And I have to add one more thing. <laughs> what started this whole thing is she's had a lot of health problems, and she's had a lot of joint problems, and she came... She, she wanted prayer because her knees were hurting, and the Lord healed her knees. Wow. That's, That's how the whole awesome. thing, yes. That's awesome.
So you ha I had to share this. That's awesome. I feel the presence of God on you even right now. <laughs> <laughs> the fire is here. The fire is here. Jesus, thank you for that refreshing, Father. Whew, season of refreshing. Jesus. Jesus. He's good, isn't he? He's good. He's faithful. And he loves his children. And he just wants to touch his people. That's all. Do you know what I'm saying? He just wants to touch his people. Some of you guys feel like you're not in that category, that qualifying category to be touched. And God says you're in that qualifying category because of his love for you. Is that okay with you? So this young girl kind of gets this word that confirms in her heart. When Roy calls her out to pray for her, he just grabs her by the hand and he just touches her. And the Holy Spirit just, just he just touches her and the Holy Spirit falls on her and she falls to the ground. <laughs> and something just happens. She has no idea. She can't even get up. She can't even get up. She, she had no idea what happened. <laughs> Lord, I release that anointing. I shouldn't be grabbing people's hands. Whew. I lose that anointing, Holy Spirit. Whew. I lose that refreshing. I lose that refreshing right now. Whew. Lord, the realm of authority that she's beginning to walk into is just now started. It's a realm of authority that is far beyond what you could ever think or imagine. But the Lord's given you a specific realm to attack sickness and to attack diseases that come against people. And the Lord says, I'm going to use you as a mighty deliverer, says the Lord. And your mouth will speak and declare and people will be get set free. And you have no need to fear. You have no need to be afraid or to think that maybe others should do it. For the Lord says, I, wrote, I have chosen you to rise up and declare with authority and boldness that sickness must flee. And the Lord says, if you will rise up and declare a sickness, free zone. God will make zones for you where the sicknesses that are upon people will begin to flee and God will create a realm of health and healing in areas around you because you have dared to believe that God would set an area free from sickness. <sighs> I loose that anointing on you, Jesus. I loose that anointing on you, Jesus. I loose that anointing on you, Jesus, Lord. And I ask for breakthrough in finances for her children, Lord. I ask for breakthrough in finances for her children, that a realm of financial prosperity will be their portion, Lord, that they would see the blessing of God in their lives and that they would feel the presence of God round about them, Lord. I call to that preacher. I call to that preacher in her household to rise up and begin to declare fearlessly the word of the Lord once more time, Lord, one more time, one more time, the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Holy Spirit. We love you in this house. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your anointing. And how great is my God. Sing with me how great is my God. And all will sing how great, how great is my God. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Holy Spirit. I love you. Do you have pain in your body? You do? Okay. <sighs> Lord, I lose that anointing. Now, I know you might have difficulty from a surgery or whatever, but I believe that God wants to set you free from pain, and you know he'll take you wherever you're at, wherever your faith level is, whatever you feel in your heart. Even if you feel like, God, I can only give a little bit, that's okay. Because it only needs a little bit. So, Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I break off all pain out of this woman's body right now in the name of Jesus. And I declare the attack of the enemy on her life. And every time he's tried to take her out, I cancel that right now in the name of Jesus. I cancel that attack right now in the name of Jesus. And I loose that healing anointing all the way through her body. <laughs> all the way through her body, all the way through her body. Heaven, invade your body right now. And every demonic attack is taken over right now in the name of Jesus. And I just loose that healing anointing right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now you should just feel that fire just going all the way through you. 
that healing presence just going all the way through you. I loose it. I loose it. I loose it. Jesus. What are you feeling right now? My hands don't hurt at all. Your hands don't hurt? I'm so sorry, but it's going. But it's going. Now, I need you, if you can. I don't know. I just feel like you just walk with me for a little bit. Are you okay to walk? It's not difficult for you, is it? It's a, a little struggle. Bit. It's a struggle. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I see that this woman has a, a place of faith that she's walking into right now. <sighs> Lord, I thank you for all the pain, all the, ta all the attacks on her body to go right now in Jesus' name. Yeah. And why do you have pain in your hands? Why, what's, what is that from? Your hands are like beat red. My goodness gracious. Like arthritis in every one of my joints. In every one of your joints. So you it's have had a major attack. It's in my hands. It's Whew. only in my hands. Only in your hands. Father, Jesus, I just thank you, Father. I loose that anointing of the Holy Spirit on this woman right now. I thank you for her boldness to walk with me. I thank you for her boldness to step out, Father. Because when she gets healed, other people have faith to get healed, Lord. And this woman is willing to pursue you so that others could be healed as well, Father. And I thank you for 100% healing right now, all the way through her body in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now, do you have pain in your legs or anything like that in your leg? Okay, so right now, we just release that right now in the name of Jesus. Now, I just, I didn't ask you to walk for any other reason, but God just said that, okay? I'm not, I don't pick things. I don't pick those, but I understand it might not be that easy, so I'll let you sit down. But, Lord, I loose that healing anointing through her hands right now. Your hands are really warm, and I just loose all that pain right now in Jesus' name. <sighs> Jesus, I just feel that anointing all over you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now go like this with your hands. Jesus, do you see how easy that is? The pain level's gone right down. In Jesus' name, Lord, that healing anointing still going through her body. Jesus, that healing anointing still going through that body. And Lord, he's also restoring to you hope and restoring to you what things the enemy has taken away from you. He's not only doing your body, but also the deep things of your heart. And I want you to know how much he loves you <sighs> to take away every weight that has been upon you and to bring back and restore hope one more time for you. In Jesus' name, Lord, and I ask that you give her every miracle that she asked for, whatever she asked for, that you give it to her. <sighs> In Jesus' name, this woman's getting touched too. <sighs> Jesus, thank you for being a starting point. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I loose that anointing right now. Woo! 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 He is. He's your doctor. <laughs> Jesus, just keep doing that with your hands. That's the healing anointing on you right now, sister. <laughs> he doesn't. You're 82. You're working. <laughs> You're working. You're working. You're working. You're working. Working the passion and the presence of Jesus. Working. Working. I loose that anointing. I loose that anointing. You in the, in the purple shirt. I want to pray for you. Do you mind? Come out here. Jesus, I loose that healing anointing. I'm going to go back to the important things in the service. Give me a second. Lord, I loose that anointing. Will somebody just watch her? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for that healing anointing coming on my sister. <gasps> all the way through her right now. That's it. That's it. <gasps> all the way through you right now. Take it all the way through you. I loose that anointing all the way through you. Jesus, Lord, I give her a refreshing. I give her a refreshing. <gasps> I loose that anointing all the way through her. In Jesus' name, the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't he awesome? I lose that anointing. I lose that anointing. You know what? Right now, even as I'm praying, I feel like somebody's going to have a healing anointing just go right through their knees. I lose that anointing. I lose that anointing. I lose that anointing right now in the name of Jesus. I lose that anointing. Jesus. 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 I just want you to know the kingdom of heaven is so real. It is so real. It is so real. It's like... The thing is, is it's, it's right here with us, but sometimes we just don't understand that it's right here. 
I just feel that healing anointing going through somebody's knees. knees. Now, if you feel that right now, you can... Oh, you're, you're... Okay, the lady I went to. <laughs> I should know this by now. <laughs> I lose that anointing. <gasps> I lose that anointing. I explode the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want you to do is a great leap of faith. Get up and begin to use your knees like you could never use them before. I loose those knees right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Woman of faith, woman of power, woman of authority. Those knees will stand strong. Those knees will take leaps and bounds you've never taken before. Lord, I loose her right now in the name of Jesus. I loose these knees. I loose these knees. I loose these knees. I loose these knees right now. By the power of the blood of Jesus, I loose these knees. Now go ahead of me. Go on. I loose those knees right now. I loose those knees. Somebody else has gotten their knees right now. Somebody else's knees right now. I loose somebody else's knees right now. In the name of Jesus, if that's you, take it right now. Who is that with your knees? Take it. Get up right now. Let the Holy Spirit. Come on. Get it right now. Get it right now. Your knees, are they okay? Yes. You need a knee replacement. You need to run. 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 <sighs> Lord, I loose these knees right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. I loose these knees right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just walk. Just by faith. It's, are you scared? No. I can't bend down and get back up again. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. In the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. Now, is there pain? There is pain. Okay, stay right here. Father, in the name of Jesus. Actually, you. Go play hands on her. I'm not going to do all the work. You got knees, too? You got knee problems, too? You got braces? In the name of Jesus, I command these knees to be completely healed. I command these knees to be straight right now. In the name of Jesus, I command a loosening of these knees right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, I release this man right now. Here, just give me your arm. I'm just going to walk with you like we, I took you out for dinner. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, I loose these knees. This man of faith and power, Lord, you've called him to preach the gospel and to set many free, Father. But in the middle of that, give him a heart of faith and let these knees rise in power and knees be completely restored and you know what I say he will not have an operation he will not have an operation I declare it over him right now now you can go without me go ahead just keep going right now in the name of Jesus how are your knees doing that's okay. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I command those knees to be completely healed. A person of faith will not be denied. You will not be denied right now in the name of Jesus. Go down again. In the name of Jesus, how are your knees right now? They feel warm. That's the healing power of Jesus. <sighs> the healing power of Jesus right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The healing power of Jesus right now. The healing power of Jesus right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You have to walk one more time, sir. I'm not being mean to you. <laughs> Jesus. Lord, I loose this woman's knees. I give her, and this is what I did. Oh, I forgot. The Lord wanted me to say something else. That I, you are not just about your knees, but that God is about changing your heart to walk in a new realm. For God says there are things I put on your heart and things that you're called to do, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I will come through for you. So you, as you begin to walk in a new realm, know this. I will back you up with great power and great authority. And even right now today, you know that just coming up here was not just about your miracle, but it was about you stepping out in faith towards God. Because because you need to see him come through in greater power and greater authority. And this is just the beginning, says the Lord your God. For your breakthrough is here right now today. And you will begin to see the finances blossom around about you. And you will begin to see those that have attacked you in the past begin to fall away. As I, the Lord your God, stand up as your deliverer and one who can take authority for you on your behalf. And in the name of Jesus, I loose the power of God all the way through this lady right now. There it is. Take it all the way through her. Oh, in Jesus' name. I loose that authority right now. In Jesus' name. Hold on one second. One second. Does somebody have a, 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 a hernia? Oh, dear sir, you have hernias? Dear sir, your knees, are they in pain? You're, you have something in your heart as well. Okay, I should know this. I'm standing by people and I get words of knowledge when I'm by them. But I see like a cyst or something in somebody's stomach. You have a cyst on your ovary. Anybody else? So maybe it's you. You too. Are you going to be bold today? God's going to heal you today. 
Somebody stand behind this man. Is it hurt right now? Put your hand on it right now. <sighs> Let the power of Jesus begin to go through this cyst right now. Hernia, I command you to leave right now. The kingdom of heaven comes and takes over this thing right now in the name of Jesus. <gasps> Jesus, with this, uproot other things that have happened to you, but I uproot them right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. Now let it go all the way through you. I loose that thing right now. Jesus, by your power, by your blood, I say, go in Jesus' name. I loose it right now, all the way through him right now in Jesus' name. Now keep your hand right there. Just let that anointing go all the way through you. Oh, there it is. He's touching you. Jesus, just stay right there. Jesus, where is that other girl? Where'd she go? Where'd she go? Where are you? Come here. Come here. Jesus, take my hand. Do you have pain in your body? Oh, yes. You do? No, I just want you to say this. Jesus, I take authority over every attack of the enemy, on my body, on my family, on my household. And I command it to go now. In Jesus' name. Put your hand on your heart. <sighs> now I command every cyst and every over on every ovary and every hernia and every tumor to go right now in the name of Jesus. I break it off you. You're going to begin to feel it go through your body now. All the way through your body. There it is. All the way through your body from the top of your head. <laughs> All the way through you. <laughs> All the way through you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. The explosion of Jesus all the way through you. Jesus, Jesus, I loose that right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come here, sweetie. You're just getting touched, aren't you? This is your day. Yeah. Do you have any pain? No. Father, in the name of Jesus, because this girl gave her life to you just a couple days ago, this is just the way you show her your power. Are you ready for him to touch you? Close your eyes. Father, let an unusual power, healing power, take this body over right now in the name of Jesus. And I loose, there it is, all the way through you. I loose that anointing all the way through her in Jesus' name. I loose it. Do you feel it going through you? Just keep letting it go through you. You've got to drink more. That's God's doing, a reforming power, a reforming power. Do you have pain still there? Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I command this to go. In the name of Jesus, I command this to go. In the name of Jesus, I command this to go. In the name of Jesus, I command it to go. Go, in the name of Jesus. I will not be denied. You will leave right now, and I command everything that attacks this body, spirit of infirmity, I command you to loose this man right now. In the name of Jesus, loose right now. By the power and the authority of Jesus, the Son of God, I loose you right now. Whew. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, I loose you right now. I loose you. There it is. I loose you right now. Oh, I can feel the presence of God all the way over you. All over you. Boy, he's wrecking you. Boy, he's wrecking you. Jesus. 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 Saints, just pray. Just pray for him. Don't get disengaged. Don't get bored. Jesus, you want to turn? You want to touch from heaven? I don't have to call your name. I don't have to call you out. Just take, just say, Lord, I want my miracle. <sighs> Jesus. Jesus name you okay your feet are frozen and your hands does it feel weird <laughs> I 
that's. You all right? Your your knees. You starting to feel a little better? Just keep letting that anointing go over you. Jesus, we love you, Father. We love you, Father. You can say anything if you need to. Jesus. I said if you need to say anything if you I love you. I love it when God touches people, don't you? I love it. How do your knees feel? They still feel great? You have a problem yours feel warm still? Yours were? Can you move your knees without pain? Could you do that before? A little bit more stiffer. So do they feel? Really? So is there pain right now? No. It just happened out of the blue. Is it, so what could you not normally do? That right there? Yeah. And you can't normally do that? Do that again. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Any pain? No pain. Do it again. Well, come on. If it's a miracle, we want to see it's a miracle. <laughs> Is that awesome? Is that awesome? Give God praise. Give God praise. That's awesome, man. Give me five. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I think it's this thing. How are you feeling? You have pain in your body, Andy? You do. Well, I didn't know you had pain. Well, from? Football. Football? Give me a hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, you, God's still touching you. He's still touching you. I see him all over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, let that healing of power go all the way through Andy. And Father, right now, actually, I break off of you, Andy, the attack of the enemy that comes against your mind, that comes against your heart. And Lord, I just release him right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask for that tangible presence of the healing anointing of God to go all the way through him right now. In Jesus' name, I loose him right now by the power of the blood of Jesus. There it is, all the way through you. Healing anointing going all the way through you. Jesus. Jesus. Like explosions in your body. <laughs> like explosions in your body. I'm commanding things to pop back in line that have popped out of place. Commanding things to line up with the word of God right now by the power of the blood of Jesus right now. In Jesus' name. I'm also just going to loose this right now. I just feel somebody. I just feel right now like there's people are tangibly feeling that healing anointing on them right now. I just feel that tangible healing anointing on you. Whew. I don't know if you function in the healing anointing or if you're getting a healing, but I feel like you can tangibly feel that healing anointing on you. Whew. Lord, I loose that healing anointing. Whew. I loose that healing anointing. Whew. I loose that healing anointing. Whew. I loose that healing anointing. The Lord says, the Lord says, to those that are here in this body right now, the Lord says, but the healing power of God that you have cried out for and the tangible healing presence of God that you have called out for is even now in your midst. And I, the Lord your God, have come down like an eagle to its children to answer the cries and the desperation of people who have been broken and torn and beat up by sickness and disease. And the Lord your God says, if you will cry out to me, I indeed will come through with a mighty healing power, a mighty healing move, and I will rise up in a healing strength one more time and you will see miracle upon miracle upon miracle and the Lord your God says remember prophecy number one and prophecy number two and prophecy number three that I spoke over you again it will rise up and it'll get it'll take strength and I will be the God that hears and answers and I will be known in Elmira as a God that answers prayer and a God that answers by fire <sighs> I loose that anointing 
In Jesus' name. I loose that anointing. I loose that anointing. I loose that anointing. You, dear sir, have a healing anointing on your life. You, dear sir, have a mighty healing anointing on your life. And the power of God has already come in mighty strength. And the Lord says, I again will renew you and make you to rise up on Ingle's wings. And the Lord says, don't worry about the things of the past, for I will bring it something brand new, says the Lord. And the Lord says, three mighty miracles, three mighty miracles of notable strength will I give you to again reassure you that I am here and that I am answering your prayers and that I am renewing you on the strength of eagle's wings. And the Lord says, what you ran before is only the beginning for the world is your footstool and you will run like a fire around the nations of the world and the glory of God will pour out on you like never before. And God says, people of every color will run unto the name of Jesus Christ because of the healing power of God that you allowed a season of brokenness and stripping to come upon you to Bring it in your life in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, 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 you okay? <laughs> Take more than Andy. Watch him. I loose him right now. I loose him right now. Let that anointing just go all the way through him. Let a drunkenness come on him, Lord, a new drunkenness. Whoa. I loose it right now in the name of Jesus. I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I haven't forgotten about you, Michael. I, did, I know God wants me to talk to you, but I hate speaking to people I know, but... The Lord says a season of breakthrough for you and your household. And the Lord says you've gone through a season of crying and seeking my face and asking for a new freshness and a new reality of my presence in your life. And the Lord says even now, my son and my daughter, you walk into a season where the resources of heaven are at your hands and the Lord is calling you to something new and something fresh. And the Lord says that even, even in the instruments of my music and the instruments of worship and in the voice that is so clear to your heart, I will use you to release a sound in your environment and in those around you of refreshing and of stirring one more time. And the Lord says, if you have stirred up others and you have held up the arms of others, I will use you to stir others one more time, says the Lord. And you will walk out in a mighty fire. And the Lord says, a tangible experience of the power of the presence of God in your midst, my son. I will release it now. And I will begin to contact you in dreams and visions. And you will see a plan before you that is un impossible for you to walk in. But know this, I, the Lord your God, when I give you a dream and a vision, I will make it work and I will make it happen. And it's time of breakthrough and a season of restoring comes into your household now. <gasps> in Jesus' name. In <sighs> Jesus' name. Jesus' name. <sighs> Jesus. <sighs> Jesus. <sighs> Jesus, I lose that anointing, healing power over her body right now. The presence of God. Jesus. <sighs> Jesus, I don't know what season you've walked through, but the God's been preparing you, and he's doing a work. Sometimes the seasons that are hard, we feel like we've missed God, but it's not that. He's just stripping us so that he can cause us to carry more. I have a very important thing I want to share real quick. It just came to my mind, and this is, a, this is in relation to stripping. Is that your wife? Are you related to somebody over here? Is this your wife? I, I haven't forgotten about you either. I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> now, listen. Separate those two messages, one from another. I was talking to her. I'm going to go back. I had nothing to do with her at that moment. I'm talking about a season of pulling things out of you, okay? <laughs> Not stripping. A stripping away of the things of God, okay? <laughs> stripping. 
stripping. I want to tell you a story, okay? This came to my mind. I think this is very important. <sighs> You're in tears. I just want to encourage you, if you believe God for the miraculous, it will come to you. Yes. just want you to know that. Sometimes people think there's going to be a mighty price, but I'll tell you, you've already paid a price. And you've already given up a lot. And I see you've stood in the face of a challenge to compromise and a challenge to go and be normal and be average and be like every other people in your community. And you said, no, you wouldn't do it, and you paid a heavy price for it. And the Lord says, if you ask him and if you'll seek him for the miraculous, you'll begin to see it come to pass. <laughs> the Lord says the voice of the enemy will rise up against you and try to cause you to be discouraged. But the Lord says if you will ignore that voice and not respond to it and not talk back to it and not try to defend, but stand and look in the face of God, that voice will be brought low and it will no longer speak. And it will begin to turn and praise the name of the Lord. And the Lord says that voice will be won over. But not only that, the Lord says he's going to give you the down and out, some of the hardest to win cases in your community, people that are very difficult to win over, people that are difficult to, to get saved. They're going to be a testimony in the body of Christ, in your church, and in the, to the glory of the Lord around you. In Jesus' name. Now, to the season of stripping I was referring to. <laughs> there, was a, there was a man who was an evangelist, and he was a, he's a mighty evangelist to this day. He has seen crowds of millions of people gather at his crusades. He stood over and talked. He has seen the dead raised. He has seen people walk out of wheelchairs. He's seen blind see. He has filled whole entire civic centers. This man has two stories, and I'll tell you one of the stories that's most significant. Sometimes you're looking at your resources, and you're looking at what you have, and you're looking at the arena that God has given you, and you're holding on so tight. And you feel like every enemy that's known to mankind is coming and trying to steal your resources. And you're like a little child with his blankie. Anybody got a blankie? Here's a little blankie. Oh, my gosh, it's even a kid's blankie. This is awesome. You're like a little kid with your blankie. This is my ministry, and this is what God wants me to do. And you've got the, somebody trying to pull it away from you. Trying to pull it away. Okay, and you're holding on with all that you can, and it's, she's stronger than me. That's good. Go ahead. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you feel like, I don't want to let go. This is all I got. I'm fighting for what God wants me to do. And all along, the blankie gets further and further and further away from you. And this man had a ministry of evangelizing, and he had a tent that he put up, that he built. And he's praying, and he's asking God, I want to go to another level. I want to see you move in my life, right? This man, he's pursuing God. And he gets frustrated because he's at this level, and he can't seem to break through. And one day he puts up his tent, which is all he has, and what God is using powerfully for years has used this tent powerfully to touch thousands of people. People have flocked underneath this tent, and this is what God had blessed him with. But one day he put up his tent for a, sto for a meeting, and a storm came through and blew over his tent. Destroyed his tent to shreds. And you know what's so amazing about that? Is so many times we're trying to hold on to what God has given us, to our ministry, to the little things that we think are so important, our, our schedules, our things in life that are so much to us. I held on for years to my ministry, to my prophetic ministry, my dance ministry, and all these things that I wanted to do with my life because they were me and they were my identity and they were how God used me and I felt so significant and wonderful in them. And yes, God had blessed me with prophecy, and God had blessed me to be able to dance because I was not allowed to dance as a child. It was against our religion. And so I began to dance and worship God, and I led a whole ministry, and I began to do all kinds of things for the Lord. And when I prayed the prayer, and I said, God, I'll give you everything if you'll give me more of you and more fruit in my life. He stole all of that out of my life. And I'm telling you, I thought it was the enemy. 
I thought it was the enemy with every heart and passion inside of me. I thought it was the enemy. I grabbed my little blankie and I held on as much as I possibly could. I rebuked every enemy that tried to steal my blankie. I tried to hold on, tried to keep it as close as possible. You ain't taking my baby blankie. I've had this since I've been a little kid. This is how I go to sleep at night. This is how I feel comfortable. And you know what was so awesome about when that man's tent was destroyed? The Lord came to him as he wanted to buy a new tent. And he said, the reason why I destroyed your tent is because a tent cannot hold the millions of people I want to bring into your ministry. And he began to hold open-air crusades. And millions of people came to his open-air crusades. His name is Reinhard Bunke. And he has signed people raised from the dead. Literally a man, a pastor, or died. And he was raised from the dead. And his testimony has gone all around the world. But because he yielded to what God God was willing, wanted to take away from him. And he said, God, strip me. Take away everything. I give, I yield everything. He was able to go to another level. I mean, are we holding on to little blankies? Are we holding on to our comfort zone? Are we holding on? What are we holding on to? I want to tell you, I, t I told that this story about blind Bartimaeus the night that one guy got healed. Blind Bartimaeus was a tremendous figure in the Bible. But I want to tell you something about blind Bartimaeus that really shocked me. When he called out after God, you've got to remember blind Bartimaeus, wonderful man of God. I mean, wonderful, I mean, a wonderful testimony of God. But when he first cried out to God, he's sitting there blind, and he had nobody, you know, he didn't see where Jesus was. He had nobody really to tell him what to do because what happened when blind Bartimaeus cried out to God is everyone told him to shut up. Do you remember that? Anybody remember that story? Now, I want you to remember this. You might think about it like, yeah, well, I would keep crying out to Jesus if they told me to shut up. But you forget something about blind Bartimaeus. This thing that he wore around him was a cloak. And this cloak was given to him by the government. This is a baby blankie, I know. But it was given to him by the government. And this was his legal right to collect money. Unless you had a beggar's cloak, you weren't allowed to beg in the, in, the, in the Jewish nation. Because they didn't believe in begging unless you had a disability. Why? Because they were a nation of prosperity. They didn't have a problem with prospering. Do you guys understand that? Do you know that in, in Deuteronomy, that God basically said to them, if you prosper, then the nations will know that your God is with you. But if you don't prosper, they'll know that you have basically run away from God. And God told, this is the old covenant, God told them that if you're not prospering, then people will know that God's not with you. So the Jewish people believed in prosperity. They didn't have a problem with their businesses doing well. They didn't have a problem with succeeding in life and having lots of stuff. Because it was a sign that their heart was right with God. And we should be the same way in New York. Because haven't you been called a welfare state too long? If you're a people full of the glory and power of God, the body of Christ, when they rise up to take over New York, it should be a sign of prosperity and blessing that instead of taking hand out, they are handing out. Amen. New York. A place of prosperity, a place of blessing where the church body is not in need, but they help the needy. You shall be the lender, not the borrower. That's what Jesus, that's what God our Father said. And that was just the Old Testament. Even better glory of the New Testament. Now blind Bartimaeus had this cloak, and the only way he could beg is if he kept his cloak. And you got to think, now you think to myself, if you needed a miracle, you're like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shut up. But you know what? Blind Bartimaeus didn't know that Jesus would respond to him. you got to think, he didn't even know if he was calling in the right direction. Jesus is over there, and he's going, Jesus! He's over there. He doesn't even know where he is. He doesn't have anybody to help him get to him. So when he's sitting there crying out, and he's going, Jesus, have mercy on me, the very people that are yelling at him are the people that every day would come by and put money in his little beggar's cup. They were the people that gave him bread. They were the people that gave him provision. They were the people that would help lead him to Jesus. So if you were blind Bartimaeus, you don't know if you would have stopped yelling. That's, pretty, that's a pretty big risk right there. 
He might not have said yes. He might not have stopped. Nobody else seemed to like blind Bartimaeus. Nobody else wanted him to call after Jesus. No one else thought he was significant enough to talk to the anointed man of God, the anointed master. And so his risk, he took a big risk. He stepped out against great odds when he called out. He risked losing all these relationships, all these people that fed him, that clothed him, that took care of him, that led him. He was blind. They led him from his home to his place. And not only did blind Bartimaeus continue on despite the crowd, but he did something really radical. Most people miss this. Because you can't come into the kingdom of heaven with your old self. Because your old self is part of the kingdom of the enemy. And you've got to choose one place, the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of heaven. You must choose one place. If you're going to live in heaven, the, you have to get, let go of the kingdom of darkness. Why? Because it fights against the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is joy, peace, and love in the Holy Spirit. That's not in the kingdom of darkness. And so for most people to enter into this kingdom, a greater measure of the kingdom, the biggest thing they got to let go of is their own self, their own abilities. And blind Bartimaeus, finally Jesus invited him. And you know what he did? He wasn't even healed yet. He wasn't even healed yet. And he let go. Nobody told blind Bartimaeus to let go of his cloak. Nobody said, blind Bartimaeus, if you want to be healed, put down your beggar's cloak. He said, when the master called him, he believed that he was going to be healed. He believed that God was going to touch him, and he was willing to let go of every resource in the kingdom that he had ever had in his own kingdom. And he went and he grabbed a hold of the kingdom of heaven. Do you see, when you grab a hold of the kingdom of heaven and you proclaim Jesus as your Lord and you say, Jesus is my Lord, he is my master and my savior, you are not just confessing a great name. You are not just saying something awesome to make him feel good. You are saying everything that used to belong to me, my possession, my body, who I am, is now given over to Jesus because he is a Lord. A Lord rules and he rules whatever is submitted to him. And when you take your body, and you take your household, and you take your home, and you say, I'm giving it to Jesus because he is the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. You, when you do that, you step into a new realm. You step out of the kingdom of darkness into the realm of the kingdom of heaven. And in this kingdom, you don't own your body. You don't own your, your house. You don't own your resources. You don't even own your job. You don't own your money. You don't own your business. You give it to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And thank God because everything he owns has always prospered. He has more resources resources than you could ever think or imagine. He has healing and health in his hands. And when you give your body over to him, he says, here, take what I have. Take my resources. Take the kingdom of heaven from me and let it, ab let it abide where you are. That is the resources of the kingdom of heaven that abide when you give yourself over to have be ruled by the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And wherever you go and you say to Jesus, your king, and you give yourself holy, and you say, God, I lay myself on the altar. I am going to be used by you. You're saying, I'm going to be an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. What is an ambassador? I'm going to be a representative. I'm going to represent the kingdom of heaven wherever I go. I yield, and I yield to the call of God on my life. And, you, and all of a sudden, you begin to function as a representative. And you know what happens for representatives? All of the resources of the kingdom of heaven begin to come behind you. And they say, you want to expand the kingdom? You want to bring the kingdom? You want to expand it? You want to represent kingdom heaven? If, if I were king, I wouldn't let you go out and fail. Everywhere you go, it would make me look bad. So when you begin to spread the kingdom of heaven, all of heaven has to back you up. Heaven, the kingdom, the army, their resources come from heaven because they are what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means the resources and everything that's in heaven is available here. Angels come at your disposal to back you up. Ministering spirits, the spirit of God. Because when you begin to minister the kingdom of heaven, you begin to expand it. You begin to take this area and that area. And you're like, no, you're not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. We're moving you into the kingdom of heaven. All the resources of heaven are available for you. Not for your ministry. Not for your religious idea. Not for what you want to build. But to expand the kingdom. He's in the business of expanding his kingdom. And making it real. And he wants the kingdom to go just like every natural kingdom. We don't think like this because we're not like that. And Americans aren't like this. But the British Empire was like this. 
And so was the Roman Empire. And so was every other empire that was a kingdom. They wanted to expand. And that's why they went in and they destroyed everything that wasn't like their kingdom. And they took it over. And you either had to submit to the new kingdom or be killed. And Jesus is about expanding his father's kingdom. And if you want to expand, if you want to sign up for expanding the kingdom, then all the resources of heaven are at your hand. They're at your disposal. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what does it say? Your will be done. Jesus, God, Jesus says, your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what Jesus wants? He wants heaven to look, earth to look like heaven. He wants this kingdom of heaven to look like the heaven that we're going to be in. And when you make it all look like heaven, then Jesus is going to turn it over to his Father in heaven that will all be subject to him. The kingdom of heaven. You got me? Yeah, come. My husband probably wants to share on his idea. No, no, no. His... I'm going to go on what you're just saying because I've never heard her preach that. That's fresh tonight right here in Elmira. I'm just telling you right now. I've never heard her preach the kingdom like that before. And you got to understand something about Melanie and I is that we are trying to be led by the Spirit of God everywhere we go. I made this very clear last night that we don't have a prerequisite. We don't have a list of things we're going to do and try to accomplish in four nights. We just show up and say, God, whatever you want to do. So, you know, we started tonight, and the sound had a bunch of issues and stuff, and it seemed like, oh, Lord, what are we going to do? And God goes, yeah, I'm really bothered by that. <laughs> you know, the night before that, it was like, well, what song? What, what Lord, do you want to do? And I start singing this old, old song. And the glory of God begins to fall on an old, old song. So it's like we're open to whatever God wants to do. And she's talking about the kingdom. And i got to tell you something. Now you hear me, okay? I'm, a, I'm an old Pentecostal, born and raised, you know, first started out being baptized Catholic. And then I spent most of my summers at VBS Bible School as a kid. So I'm a Baptocostal with a side of Catholic. But let me tell you something, more and more today than ever before, the Lord has been showing me my eyes to look at the kingdom instead of just the denominations or even revival or even these things. Revival is a tool that brings people into the kingdom. But the kingdom living, and somebody goes, oh, he's a kingdom now guy. No, I'm a kingdom guy. You're a kingdom person. You're a kingdom lady. You start thinking like the, the king thinks, you start seeing things totally different. And I'm telling you, because your heart lines up, as Proverbs says, so a man thinks in his heart, so is he, things have to fall in line because you believe it now as reality. Come on, is anybody hearing this tonight? You hear it as reality, and it becomes your reality. As we were traveling up and down the east coast of America, as we told this story over and over, and some people, you're new here tonight, but we were believing God for great things, and here we were. We had nothing in our hands. We were, I mean, we, we'd take up a love offering some night, and $200 would come in. And for somebody, that sounds amazing, but that's how much it costs for us just to drive to that place. You with me tonight? And so we started, and now it's even more now. I start up my bus. It's like, take a loan. Anyway, so... I, I'm, I'm like ever more now having my eyes open to the things of the kingdom and the things of heaven. And let me just say this. Ever since I had this encounter with heaven, and I did, just a month and a half ago, I had an encounter with heaven. Heaven enveloped me one night out on the front of a pastor's house on 73 acres of land overlooking the mountains in, in New York. And I was all of a sudden aware that the cloud of witnesses wasn't some cloud in heaven, but the cloud of witnesses, when the clouds move over the mountains, to people in the valley, you look up and it looks like, look at those big clouds. But to people on top of the mountain, it's a fog that just kind of rolls in. And for a split second, as we talked about heaven, I was talking with this pastor, just talking about heaven, all of a sudden, for a split second, all the trees disappeared, just like that. And I saw a mass of people standing there listening to our conversation. 
And then I went right back out just like that. And I looked at the pastor and I said, did you feel that? He goes, oh, my God. He goes, the hair's in the back of my neck right now. And somebody could say, oh, you had too much pizza. No, I didn't. I've been on a diet for 30 days, so it ain't a pizza dream. I've been the most healthiest I've ever been. And I'm telling you, there's something about understanding heaven. Why I keep, I, I was going through it all night tonight while you were preaching on it, and I kept noticing, like, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and on a sound, uh, uh, the, the 120 were gathered in one accord, one place, and then suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Let's stop for one minute. There came a sound from heaven. Where's heaven? Because if a sound came from heaven and it filled the whole house, it would have blown the place up. They would have reported the walls fell out because like hurricane force winds came in and knocked everybody out. Nobody could be standing going, isn't this awesome? <laughs> N-E-M, N-E-M. You know, I mean, it wouldn't be like that. So where's this sound from heaven? Why is it that Enoch is walking, all of a sudden, he's gone? Where'd he go? The Bible doesn't say he shot straight up into the air, went 40,000 feet, broke the barrier, went 50,000, had to get a gas mask on his way up to heaven. It doesn't say that. So I've been studying this out, and I started realizing that there's a lot of people in the years past that have studied heaven and studied the Lord that you get so close to God, all of a sudden you're not aware of the natural surroundings any longer. Give me just one second. I'm going to tell you this. I'm with this great man of God in Australia, built a church from zero to 5,000 people in about six and a half to seven years. He also established 200, over 250 churches in Australia. He was known as the man who brought the move of the Spirit to Australia. Some of the people that got saved in his meeting were the newsboys. Some of the people that got saved in his meetings was Brian Houston and his youth group because his dad used to roll with this guy, okay? This guy tells me he's had great miracles happen in his meetings all the time. I mean, all the time. He pulls somebody out of a wheelchair. This is back in the 70s, before some of you were even a thought. And he just pulled them right out of the wheelchair. And then he pulls some lady out of, a, out of her chair, and she'd have like, you know, uh, some kind of disease or something, and it would disappear and just dry up in front of everybody's eyes, that kind of stuff. And it was on video. You can look it up. You'll find it. Do some research. You'll find some of this stuff. I said, you got to tell me, how do you do that? I want to, I mean, don't you want to do stuff like that? I don't want to talk. I feel a tingling in my hand. I want, I feel a new hand growing. I didn't have a hand, now I have a hand. I had cancer, now it fell off, it's gone. So I said, how do you do that? Now he's an old, I mean, he's like, I don't know. I better be careful what my definition of old is in this place, but he's an older gentleman, and uh, he's about the age of my grandfather, and he says, Roy, I'll tell you how I did it. He says, I spent my time in meditation on the things of God. And then I would see in my imagination a woman sitting in a wheelchair over to my right. And I'd call her out and I'd lay my hands upon her and just like as if Jesus would walk up to her and grab her hand and stand her up on her feet. He said, when is prayer time while he's practicing in the spirit? Not some funky, new age, weird, universal light. It's like universal. <laughs> but actually having time with God, meditating. Uh, I forget the scripture. I think it's in Hebrews. Um, uh, whatever. No, no. It could be in anywhere in the Bible. <laughs> it says meditate on things that are noble, pure, and Okay, like he was meditating on things that were worthy, noble, and pure. And in the midst of meditating on the things of God, he begins in his imagination before he goes into the meeting that night, begins to see things. And then when he gets into the meeting, because in his imagination, he had already raised up his hand and pulled the lady out of the wheelchair. When he got to the meeting that night, he tells me, he goes, Roy, when I got to the meeting, there was a lady in a wheelchair. There was a guy over here with a tumor. And there was a person over here who couldn't speak. And he says, and I pulled him out, and immediately I already had the faith and the confidence to know because I already did it in the spirit. So when I did it in the natural, I grabbed him, and they got up on their feet, and they walked. He goes, that's how I do it. I'm like, okay, that is kingdom. 
That's kingdom. That's way beyond what we think. Amen. Do me a favor. Go to Deuteronomy 28 for just a moment. I'm going to back piggyback off of what Mel said here tonight. And uh, just bear with me for a second. We're actually closing down early. It's amazing. Lord, I just thank you that your healing happens quicker than we do it. Thank you, Lord. So chapter 28, verse 1. It says, now it shall come to pass. By the way, everybody that's watching tonight, God bless you. We are alive and well in Elmira. You don't know this, but there's been people watching from all over the world, literally Finland, Norway, Australia, England. There's people watching all over the United States. They've tuned in, tuned out. <laughs> it's true. All right, Deuteronomy 28. If you're there, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now it shall come to pass if. Everybody say if. Yeah. Interesting. There's always an if. God wants to do something. He says if. He tells blind Bartimaeus, okay, go wash your, your eyes out in the river now. But why can't you just make my eyeballs appear? He says, I need you to do that. The guy with the withered arm, stretch it forth. Why can't you just do like a Jedi Knight thing? Because he wanted him to do something. The man who's laying out and lame and he can't get up. He says, take up your bed, rise up and walk. He always says, do something now. So here it is. It says, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high. Everybody say high. high. Earlier, I was saying to the lady here, there is no high like the most high. You know, some people do drugs and alcohol. There ain't nothing on the presence of God. How do you feel, by the way? Pretty, pretty groovy. It's coming. It just will come the whole entire service. But you know what? If people will just tap into the things of God, you'll begin to feel his presence. I mean, that's what happens. People, I don't feel his presence. Well, he ain't felt you in a while either. Just something to think about. So read on to verse, I think it's four. No, my iPad needs Jesus. I saw this picture. This little girl, honey, had an iPod, and then the boy had an iPad, and then the father was holding a sign that says, I paid. <laughs> I so relate. He says that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings, verse 2, shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. How many were here last night when I told you the Lord spoke to me and told me to go back to Fort Walton Beach and do another set of meetings? And when I went back, which made no sense to me logistically, it didn't make any sense at all in my head or in my heart, but because I knew God saying it, it didn't, and there was no uh, benefit, really, except that God said just to do it. And when I went back there, there was provision waiting for us in our ministry. I didn't even know it, but because I heard his voice. Understand something, that God always is looking out for you, but sometimes we miss our blessing because we don't hear Come on, somebody. You know why some of the people are here, were healed tonight? They listen and they believed. Two things, listen, believe. When you believe, things have to happen because your heart lines up. Amen. How many believe God did something to you tonight? This lady right here, I've known you forever. And how are your knees doing? Pretty amazing. She has to have a knee replacement. Sweet. How many here are a pain in the neck? Who is that? Okay, all right. Verse three, blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. I don't know about Amira. Well, let me tell you about Amira. For those who believe, things have to happen around them. Come on, church. Signs and wonders follow those who believe. What is the alternative anyway? To walk around and not believe? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna happen. You're the kind of person who'll end up entering the depression of the Lord. <laughs> when you get to heaven, he's not going to say, enter the depression of the Lord. Well, welcome here. It's not much different. Come on in. Come on in. That's why people don't even want to go to church anymore. They look at people's faces. They go, no, thanks. 
you should come to my church. It's amazing. You'll never be the same. We have an amazing program. We have kids' school and stuff. Can I pick you up? Can I pray for you? No? No? Will you please pray for me? People look right through that. You either believe or you don't. Amen? Amen. Come on, how many believers are in the house tonight? You either believe or you don't. Signs and wonders follow those who believe. So blessed, verse 4, shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. I don't know the last time I had a basket or an eating bowl, but blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Verse 6, blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Some lady says, I always have my kneading bowl with me every single day. Yeah, anyway, you need Jesus. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Can I ask an honest question? How many people would like to be blessed as you come in a place and then the same as you come back out? Come on, how many are blessed already tonight? How about these last three nights that we've already been here? How many have found yourself opening up the word more than you had before or praying or focusing in on the things of God? Let me see your hands. That's what these meetings are for. They're not just to support another ministry. They're not just to listen to another scripture or even see another healing. It's to get people's focus back on the things of God, off the things of life. Somebody says, I can't ignore the things of life. You can't ignore the things of God. Trust me, there's plenty of things in life to take up your time. You can't ignore the things of God. That's why people are in the problems they are sometimes. They don't know how to worship. They don't know how to pour through from, the, sorry, they don't know how to pour out from their heart from deep within. They just want to come in lip service and think that God's going to do something automatically. And I've been believing God for 40 years. I've been believing God for 20 years. Back in 1947, I remember going to one of these revival meetings. Really? What happened? I got married. Oh, okay. Well, you need Jesus. You have to believe what you run after. Listen, people thought we were crazy. What are you guys doing? Go get a home. Just get a normal job, Roy. So you don't understand. This isn't like something I wanted to just do. I'd wake up in the morning with the fire of God on me. I'd wake up in the evening, in the middle of the night, with dreams of preaching and singing and leading worship and laying hands on the sick. And during the day, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I mean, it was in my vernacular. It was in everything I'd say and do. It just kept on pouring out of me. And then the next day, it happened again. And then the next day, it happened again. You ever wondered what you're called to do? Here's my question. You want to know what you're called to do? What books are you reading? What tapes are you listening to? Whose meetings are you going to? What really floats your boat and turns your whole life on by what's being spoken and done? Ryan Arn Bonke years ago, and I got friends who know him personally. In fact, the administrator who was the right-hand guy of Reinhardt did my whole Wales tour for us last year. But Reinhard was German, and he didn't have anybody open doors for him. He just believed something more than somebody else. So he says he's more favored. God really has his hand on him. Could it be that, or could it be the principle of the Cain and Abel offering that Abel gave a better sacrifice? I believe God is going to touch you today. I believe the fire of God. Today, millions have been touched by this man's ministry because he believed. He set his mind on things that are pure and holy and worth looking at and worth talking about, not just the weather and just the economic conditions. Can you say amen? amen. All right, read on verse 7. The Lord will cause. Everybody say, the Lord, the Lord. Will, cause will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. I like this verse. They shall, you ready for this? They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven different ways. So they come in, they all come in the same way and then you just go, Jesus, and they go, ah! I love it. Scatter the enemy. That's what I love to do in worship. Just scatter them, kick them in the teeth. 
then send them to a dentist. Verse 8. The Lord will command. Say command. So why are you having me say these words? Command. When God commands something, nothing in heaven or earth, the devil or angels or anything can stop once God has commanded something to happen. When God said, let there be light, there was light. Darkness couldn't go, oh no, not this time. No, God spoke and said, let there be light. It happened. It's a command from the Lord. The Lord will command the blessing on you and your storehouses and all to which you set your hand, verse 8. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Can I tell you something, Elmira, in Canton, Pennsylvania, and others that are visiting? Whatever city you're in, God has truly given you the city. Don't let people come in and tell you, oh, who do you think you are? Well, let me come over here and I'll tell you. Maybe you don't know my dad. He's the king and he runs everything. Well, who do you think you are? King's kid. Thanks. My daddy's crown's bigger than yours. It's true. That's who you serve. That's our God. He owns cattle on a thousand hills. Whatever we need, we cry out to him. He says, all right, you need something? I'll just move some around. Mm. Whatever need, whatever need you have. Amen. Come on, this is good stuff. Good preaching, Roy. Keep it coming. All right. Verse 9. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments. There's that if again. If. You keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. The Lord will establish you. Many people try to establish themselves. Hey, I was guilty of it myself when I first stepped into full-time ministry, 2005. I have an anointing. Trust me, you really want me to come to your church? It's going to be great. Watch this. It's like, look what I can do. Some of you watch too much mad TV. You didn't see what I did over there. Look what I can do. Okay, some of you, yeah, you'll get it. You try to establish yourself. You try to tell people how great you are. I know you've never done that anybody in this place before, but you try to tell people, you know, that you can do something and everything. You try to establish yourself, kind of like when you try to go get a job. You try to prove to the employer, and you lie on your resume, Christians, Oh, did I hit a nerve? I'm so sorry. I'm out of Novocaine. You try to impress the employer to tell him all that you're doing, and you try to impress yourself, and he'd rather you just come in and be yourself and do what you really do and just let him see who you really are. That person gets hired usually right on the spot. But those that try to be something else, here's the thing about God. When he establishes you, it shuts everybody else's mouth up. But come on. That's why God wants to be the one that gets the credit for establishing you. I can honestly say in my life that you hear on the video, I say, Lord, how did I get here? And I got the answer, me. Yes, Lord, I agree with that statement. God. When he establishes you, your friends won't be able to say anything. We had people speak against our meetings in 2005. They said, don't go to Roy and Melanie. They're outside of the will of God. They're not really following the Lord. They're gonna hit a wall, smack dab. But see, we had a word from heaven. We had a word from the kingdom of heaven, from God himself that spoke to my wife and I and confirmed it. Then when we stepped out, people said all the kind of stuff they said. Then all of a sudden, Lakeland happened. I didn't have to say anything. And I didn't have an arrogant attitude either. I said, well, Lord, forgive them. In fact, my heart was softened for them. I didn't want to go say, I told you, you know, kind of thing. My heart was softened. Forgive them, Lord. They're just like me. I would have done the same thing. God establishes you. Everybody else has to take a knee. Are you hearing me? God knows who he's, talk, who he's calling into ministry. God knows who he's touching. 
The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. God says he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Amen. And just because you're humble doesn't mean you don't have to be bold with the confidence of God and go after it with all the authority of heaven. We need more people that are bolder than they've been before. Come on, church. We need more people that are bolder that will go out into the highways and the actual byways and do some things like relieve people of pain. Tell them that God loves them. Now walk up to a prostitute and say, listen, lady, you smell that? Take your hair and go, get your little Holy Ghost Bic lighter out. You smell that? You're going to hell if you keep in that lifestyle. Do you know what she'll tell you as a Christian? If you tell her she's going to hell, you know what she'll tell you? She'll say, you go to hell. She already knows she's on her way. She needs to hear that somebody loves her in her condition, no matter what, that there's a Savior available to rescue her. And who does that? It's the people of God that go out with the authority of the Lord that know who they are, not people that don't have a clue who they are, but people that know God has everything waiting for them, and he can release it at any time. Come on, amen. I'm stirred by that. When she started speaking on heaven, I'll tell you, I, I just started, I, I, I was pretty much done tonight, but then you had to speak on heaven, honey. You messed me up. <laughs> Verse 10, listen to this one. You can blame God on this. This is great. God, you can get the blame for this one. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called. You won't have to prove nothing. They'll see evidence you're obviously called. Favors on your life, prosperities on your life. Wherever you go, people get healed, people get saved. When I get around you, I get caught on fire. When I get around you, I feel happy, I feel fulfilled, I feel excited, I feel wonderful, and I don't feel any doubt. I don't feel anybody pulling me down. All I feel is faith, and I feel my vision renewed. You must be from the Lord. That's what people will say. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. <laughs> can't just walk into other people's life and it's just like hey I'm just you know I'm just like you no you're not we're different you are different you're an offense to the flesh your life should be an offense to the flesh. You should have demons manifesting all around you when you walk into grocery markets, when you sit down on the train or you get on an airplane. Things should be manifesting because of who you carry on the inside of you. Amen. Do you know there's a story of Smith Wigglesworth? Got on a train, sat down in England. There was a priest sitting next to him. The priest began to confess his sins to Smith, didn't even know he was in the ministry, didn't even know he was a minister, and began to manifest demons, a priest. Because Smith knew who he was, and he sat down, and the guy just went, forgive me, please, just pray for me. Because of who he carried. Come on, come on, man. Elmira down on the corner of the bridge, some police officer comes up next to you and he's trying to just make sure everything's okay and all of a sudden he falls on knees and says, would you please pray for me? Come on, that's got to happen, man. That has got to happen in the cities all around America. All of a sudden, governments start reaching out to the church. Government doesn't want to reach out to the church right now because we're stuck in our own little tiny world instead of, in, instead of actually affecting the rest of the world around us. That's why we've been called. Light in the world, salt of the earth. They shall be afraid of you. Verse 11, I'm finishing up. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the, the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. Now look at verse 12. It's probably one of the most important things, and this is why I even brought this scripture in. This isn't just for the offering. This is right here, the heavens, right here. Watch this. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens. Forget money, forget cars, forget wealth, forget prosperity, heavens. What's in heavens? Like, what is all that? It's the anointing. It's the ability to heal somebody. It's the ability to speak to things even though you can't see them and all of a sudden they just begin to become reality. 
That is his good treasure, the heavens. People think it's in another car. I know millionaires today. They are depressed and they have money in the bank. I tell them all the time, I can help you with depression. Just make a withdrawal. Send it over here so we can do a crusade and win somebody and come with us on the trip and let's get you to lay hands on the, on the sick and the dead. Come on. I just don't know what to do anymore. My wife's left me, my kids. Yeah, you spent your whole life trying to make a bunch of money. You did nothing for God. Now you're sitting with, you know, five, six million dollars in the bank. You're depressed. I feel so sorry for you. People think that's the treasure. It's not treasure. Money? Come on. Money? Seriously. Money's not treasure. Money's just a lot of zeros. Really, it is. Just another set of zeros. Oh, if I could just get a million, I would do great things for the kingdom. Everybody wants to give 10% of a million. But nobody wants to give 10% of Nobody wants to give God what they have in their hand right this moment. That's what my wife and I did. We believed God. We didn't ask God to give us more money. We never cried out for money, but we definitely cried out for the anointing. We definitely cried out for his presence. Because when we were in Brownsville, when we were at all these other meetings and stuff where God had touched and healed our bodies and healed our hearts and got rid of 30 years of junk in our life so we could all of a sudden see clearly, that's what we wanted. I want the anointing. Are you kidding? When you walk into a room with the anointing, you listen to me. I'm going to give you a little minister tip here, okay? When you walk in the room with the anointing, you could be in a complete stranger's place. I, I got a great example. It just came to me. The fourth, no, sorry, not the fourth, the 40th. Is it the 40th, honey? Yeah, the 40th richest man in the world called me up and asked me to pray for him. I didn't know he was the 40th richest man. Nobody told me. We go to Olive Garden. He flies in on his Learjet, brings his wife, his two nannies, his four children, and we go to Olive Garden. He wanted me to pick the place. I'm like, hey, I'm New York. I like pasta. How you doing? <laughs> we go to Olive Garden. Will you pray for me, please? He says, I've been watching you on the television. He says, you have touched our whole family. He says, my whole family and friends of ours would come to the living room and we would watch you every single night. And I had to fly in here. I need prayer. Will you pray for me? He goes, I know the anointing is on your life. That's what he said. I said, sure. We're in the Olive Garden. I'm like, do you want me to pray now? We're right in the middle of pasta fagioli at the moment, but... Oh, yes, we want to pray right now. From Hong Kong, China. He pulls out these oils. I mean, he's got every Tom and Dick Harry oil from all over the world. Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley oil, frankincense, gold and myrrh. I took the gold. And then, and then no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. So he's got every oil. <laughs> sorry, sorry. He's got every oil laid out. I says, you pick it. He picks out roses, Sharon oil, or whatever, from uh, Jerusalem. So I said, okay, just line up right here. We had a private room in the Olive Garden anyway. Lined them up, and I just took the oil, and I put it on their, hand, on their heads. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't even trying to do anything. Just he asked me to pray. He believed. He didn't even need me to do anything, really, except for just touch them. That's how easy it is when the anointing's on your life. You don't even have to do anything. It's so, it's so kingdom. It's not like you have to work it. People work stuff all the time. Come on, I'm telling you, say amen, hallelujah. <sighs> Praise the Lord, you know. It's like they can't even breathe. They're working it so hard. They're sweating. They say, and yet the kingdom's easy. The good treasure of the heavens is easy. And I said, okay, I lined them up in the Olive Garden. I didn't care. There's people in the, in the, you know, in the middle of the place eating their food. And I said, okay, here we go. They lifted up their hands. And I said, Lord, just touch them the same way you touch people in Lakeland. In Jesus' name. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, well, I run out of things to do, so back to eating pasta. <laughs> there was no, it wasn't like I had to say something more profound or anything. The anointing will make the way for you. 
And not knowing he was the 40th richest man, the next day he slapped a huge check into our ministry. I didn't even have a clue what he was doing because the anointing makes the way. Let me tell you something. You don't need money. You need the anointing. You don't need a new house. You don't need a new car. You need the anointing. You need the presence of God. You need his good treasure, the heavens. Come on, somebody say amen in this place tonight. Let me finish the scripture and then we'll close up here. Roy, you said that three times. I know, four more times it's coming. Verse 12, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season. Remember I read from 1 Kings 17 last night. Elijah was saying that when his word comes, then the rains will come, which means sometimes God holds things back from you so you'll press into him. So when you press into him, he goes, finally, you've come after me, and he dumps on you. Come on, that's, nobody's getting that. I'm the only one. He dumps on you. I'm talking about the windows of heaven go boom and just hit you overnight. You're like, I didn't see that coming. And God goes, I know. <laughs> He's the God of the suddenlies. There's, there's 120 men waiting for the Holy Ghost, just doing what the Lord said, wait. Wait upon the Holy Spirit, he shall come. When he comes, he'll fill you with the Holy Spirit, and you shall be my witnesses to the end of the earth. Is he coming today? Day goes by. What are y'all doing? Waiting. Why are you waiting? The Lord told us to. Three days later, what are you doing? <sighs> waiting. <laughs> Four days later, what are you doing? All of a sudden, insanity starts to set in. Peter and John start debating each other. Peter starts claiming, whatever, John, you laid your head on his chest. Yeah, he called me Satan. He only says that to people he likes. Day five, what are you doing? Waiting. Day six, they start eating each other. I mean, I don't know. They're just sitting around there like waiting. It's a boring meeting. Nothing's going on. There's not even any musician. Could you play some music? But nobody has a keyboard. Nobody has a sound system. In fact, back then it was Gregorian chants. For the Lord said he'd send his spirit. I can feel the anointing now. I'm lying, I feel nothing. <laughs> Day eight, Thomas says, if you sing one more time, I will send you to heavenly places. <laughs> Think about this. He's the God of the suddenlies. Finally, by day 10, they're like, is he even coming? But see, here's the deal. And this is how Christian life, I can see the parallel actually just now. This is how Christian life is. Do you still believe even when everything is torn away from you, when everything falls apart, nothing seems to be working, everything's falling down, it doesn't seem like there's any favor anywhere, are you still faithful with what he's given you right now in your hands? There's a little scripture that says this, if you're faithful with the little, he'll make you ruler over much. Will you buckle under pressure and just squander everything or will you trust him when the time comes where everything seems impossible and difficult and you're never going to get breakthrough? Will you trust him then? Why would God want to give anybody the heavenly places or why would he want to give any of his anointing to people that can't even measure out in regular earthly things and practice good principles with that? He's looking for people that are just tenacious. They just don't care. If anything falls apart, it doesn't matter. God spoke, I'm continuing on. I'm moving forward. He said to keep his commandments. I'm going to keep his commandments. I don't care if my whole Bobby, my, Bobby? I don't care if my whole, <laughs> I don't care if my whole body is maimed. It's better that I go to heaven maimed than go to hell with my whole body intact. You understand what I'm saying tonight? So God's looking to establish you. It's like everything's in your favor. 
Everything's in your favor. It's just a matter of believing. 